So we're going to talk about trauma today, yeah? A little bit of a departure from maybe uh, some of the more abstract topics that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. Like I say, there is some patho, but it does link quite heavily to part two. So what I want you to keep in your head with all of these presentations today is that when you go out into practice placement, there's going to be some considerations you're going to add on top of what you already do when it comes to trauma patients. You're not able to do the skills yet, but you're going to work with lots of different people and I want, them, I want you to keep them in your head. Yeah, Think about how am I going to keep this patient alive? Yeah, That's what this is all about. What patients die and how do I stop them from dying? It's very dramatic, all right? Fine. So we're going to talk a bit about pre-hospital care of trauma patients in general, just to start with before we start talking about patho. This is all about picking the right things to do. Yeah, you've got a huge gamut of drugs and physical skills, things that we can do to patients, but it's all about picking the right ones, the ones with the most value in order to affect mortality. Yeah, and in order to do that, we need to understand some underlying principles. So we're gonna discuss generally the pathophysiology of traumatic injury and what factors contribute to survivability. All right. So this trauma is a huge, huge problem. And I think we have a little bit of a skewed perception depending on where we work. Some of you might see loads of trauma and some of you might see very little. But don't be lulled into a false sense of security. Trauma kills 5 million people across the world every year. 5 million, that is mental. <laughs> That's a huge amount of people. In the UK, I think it's around 16,000 per year. And in Scotland, 4,000 people a year are severely injured or die through trauma, right? So big, big numbers of patients. According to the WHO, trauma across the world kills more people than malaria, HIV, and TB combined. Now, why do you think that is across the world? Anybody got any suggestions? Why does trauma kill? What was that? Ambulance, <laughs> ambulance waiting times, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, if you live in Zambia, yeah, your ambulance waiting time is going to be pretty damn long, yeah, because there isn't any, right? So you're totally right. That is a huge contributor, even in Scotland. Ambulance waiting times contribute massively to pre-hospital mortality. Yes, totally. And across the world, the point I'm trying to get across is that in the UK and in Scotland, we have quite a well-developed trauma response network, even though the ambulance waiting times might be quite long. But in other countries, the developing world, they might not have an ambulance service at all. So no wonder people die from trauma so often. Things like motor vehicle safety, industrial accidents are much more prevalent in the developing world because there's just not the safety regulations we have here. And even then, <clears throat> lots of people die from trauma in the UK. So big problem for us. And I think what strikes me about trauma care and the, the experience that I have in terms of looking after trauma patients is that we're massively privileged. We I go on about paramedic privilege all the time, but we're usually the first healthcare professionals that get to the scene of a, of a trauma incident, yeah? We go on about pre-hospital critical care teams and oh, aren't they great being able to cut holes in people's chests and all that sort of thing. But actually, it's not really them that affects the mortality of the patient. In the first few minutes, the first 20 minutes of care, it's, it's us. We're the ones, paramedics are the ones that see the patients first. So the interventions that you pick are going to make the biggest difference to the patient, yeah? And then deciding, do I get a pre-hospital critical care team or do I take the patient to them or do I go to hospital? These are all decisions that you're going to have to make in a very short space of time. Cool. So this series of lectures, like I said, has lots of PA stuff. Andy gets a little bit jealous because he wants to talk about PA and I don't let him, we shoehorn stuff in, all right? There is a lot of patient assessment stuff in here that is underpinned by patho, but we're gonna try and avoid going, okay, we're gonna assess the airway first and then we're gonna do breathing. What comes before airway? Catastrophic hemorrhage. We're not gonna talk about that today, but I think when you go, and we're going to talk about trauma, you expect that. Don't come away from here being like, oh, Dan talked about the clot and cascade, but I don't really know much more about how to manage my trauma patients. That'll all add up in part two. So it all adds up together, okay? <clears throat> we're going to look at the pathophysiology of physical injury and how our bodies respond to physical insult, yeah? These concepts are crucial to good patient management because if we know how they work, then we know what interventions to pick. Is that fair? Grant. I googled Grim Reaper and this is the best, this was the, the best one I could find. So <clears throat> who dies from trauma, yeah? 
what we're going to talk about here is the concept of survivability. Which patients are going to survive? Because some patients, unfortunately, just aren't going to survive. Yeah. So our involvement in trauma centres around survivability. I think it, the latest Public Health Scotland report, which was full of information about COVID, didn't talk hugely about, about trauma, said that 20% of patients in Scotland died from major trauma at the scene. And that there was this distribution of patients, the patients that died like a couple of days after their injury or a couple of weeks, the patients that died within the six hours and the patients that died within the first hour. And that there was this total disproportionate amount of patients that died like within the first hour of injury. Yeah, everyone heard of the golden hour? This is where those interventions that I'm talking about are gonna make the most difference. Everyone happy with that concept, yeah? Cool. So, <clears throat> the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, who have some lovely guidelines on pretty much anything, came up with a set of trauma recommendations in 2016. Has anybody read them? No? Okay. If you get the chance, it's actually, it's not a super boring document. There's some really interesting stuff in there. They came up with a set of five recommendations that would address this mortality problem or address this sort of everyone's dying within the first hour from trauma thing. So they came up with the first thing, patients need to go to a particular place. Have you all had the major trauma triage presentation? Yeah, lots of notes around the room. So that's what this is all about. The major trauma network is about defining where we take major trauma patients because that's not always a major trauma center. If you live near mid or if you practice near a major trauma center, then that's great where they go and they all go to the Royal, that's easy peasy. But if you don't live near a major trauma center, you're gonna make the decision as to where they go or you're gonna make the decision to bring a trauma team to the patient to then fly them to a major trauma center. That's gonna be your decision making. So effective destination is the first one. Then there was management about airway management and particularly eye gel usage in, uh, in pre-hospital trauma. NICE recommend that we use an eye gel as a first line if the patient can't maintain their own airway and then if they need it, rapid sequence induction, but we'll talk about that in a wee second. So airway management recommendations, things about needle decompression in chest trauma, identifying whether they have a pneumothorax. Are we all comfortable on how to identify a pneumothorax? No, good, Some, a few nods around the room. We've got a tool for this, NICE have introduced a tool and then SAS have introduced a tool so there's no ambiguity because we get scared about sticking needles in patient's chest for obvious reasons. Management of hemorrhage, so this is TXA. Do we give fluids versus do we bring blood to the patient? This affects mortality massively. So we're gonna talk a bit about this. And effective pain relief. Now I've heard lots of paramedics say to me, just got IV morphine, mate, it's no great. Do you know what I mean? NICE actually recommend IV morphine as the first line agent in pre-hospital trauma. Yes, there's lots of other fancy drugs that we don't have access to yet. But tr morphine is actually pretty effective in the pre-hospital situation, along with paracetamol. So five broad recommendations. And what I want to do before we dive into patho today is I want to break these down and talk about why we've made those recommendations. There's also the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care, which is a Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh led, and they have some consensus statements. Now I've put these on Blackboard for you to read, uh, more bedtime reading for you. They are publicly available consensus statements from experts in the field. They take evidence, they push it all together into one document and they go, this is what we think is the right thing to do based on the evidence. This makes our decision making much easier. So if you want, visit their website. All their guidance is online and it is considered gold standard alongside the NHS and the NICE guidance. I think the most recent one was 20... 19, but some of them are a bit older, 2016, 2015, they're still the most relevant. Fine. So paramedic-led trauma care. <laughs> Traditionally, what do we do with trauma patients? Oh, a diesel, mate. Get them all to hospital, eh? Just chuck them in the motor and go. And do you know what? That is, it's not totally invalid. Some patients do just need to go to definitive care straight away, and that's fine. But paramedic-led trauma care has came on massively in the last decade, in the last 20 years, and we've now got a lot of tools which we can use to stabilize our patients before we move them. That's what we're gonna talk about today. So evolved massively prior to this, we had this scoop and run policy. We were piling two liter liters of fluid into our patients before we moved. Thankfully, I hope we're past that, long, long past that by now. The science of trauma has moved on and we need to move on with it, all right? 
So let's look at these items of nice guidance. So the first one is this most appropriate destination. So how can we decide where we're going to take our patients? I've just mentioned it. Good. Yeah, the triage tool. Do you like the triage tool? Nobody, nobody dislike it? Everyone used it? It is quite long-winded, yeah? Saying that, though, it does remove any sort of ambiguity around decision-making. It is a little bit long-winded, but when you read through it, it should be fairly obvious why it's making the recommendations that it does. I guess also it depends on where you work. So, <clears throat> basically, this is all about the most obviously injured patients need to go to a major trauma center. Why? Because major trauma centers have 24-hour surgical coverage, neurosurgery coverage, uh, blood product, all that stuff, right? But what patients might we consider taking to uh, an ED or a trauma center first? So airway compromised patients, why? <sighs> Makes me so happy, perfect, exactly. So this is all about figuring out what's wrong with your patient, what's gonna kill them first, yeah? And then either getting them stabilized at the roadside by a trauma team or taking them to a hospital to get st stabilized first, yeah? That's, that's exactly the underpinning principles. So the Scottish Trauma Network are highly implicated in this, and obviously this is an evolving thing, but the major trauma triage tool is there to direct us. And you're right, it is a little bit long-winded, but actually there's only four steps to it. I know you probably can't see that great there, but we're not gonna work through it, I promise you. Patients who are hemocompromised, they have a GCS of less than 14, respiratory rates low, penetrating injuries, chest walls, degloving,s amputations. These are obvious, yeah, they need, they need a surgeon. So we're gonna take them straight to a surgeon. Things like trauma units, that's when it gets a little bit woolly for me, falls, things like that. They can go to a, a trauma unit if that's closer or an MTC. And then local EDs pretty much get either critically ill patients that need stabilized or patients that don't, they aren't major trauma positive. Yeah, so if you haven't used this much, please take time to look at it because it is a good tool. So that's the first element of the nice guidance. And we've already got a great tool to use. So to me, that's not difficult, but that is a little bit, oh, not paramedic by numbers, but paramedic by guidance, yeah? So then we have airway care. So nice recommend that all trauma patients get rapid sequence induction at the scene of the accident. Is that always practical? No. And you go, why are you talking about RSI, Colin? It's not something that we do. You're right, it's not something that we do, but we are going to be making the decision to say, bring me somebody who can do this. Yeah, or the trauma cell are gonna be making it. So I want you to look at your patient's physiology. If they aren't able to maintain their own airway, then making that call early, you have eye gels, you have loads of other ventilation techniques, but making that call early to say, Dan, I think we need a trauma team here. Let's get them coming nice and early. That's the kind of thing I want you to think about. Because actually, according to the data, delivering this at scene gives us better outcomes than delivering it to hospital, okay? If your patient's totally obtunded, then us doing basic adjuncts and using eye gels is the next best option in terms of definitive airway care. So if your patient doesn't have an airway, I would advise using an eye gel. Yeah, they're great tools. They work really, really well. People get annoyed at me for saying that their insertion is easy, but I'm sorry it is. Yeah, if you know it well, then it, it shouldn't be difficult. Uh, definitive airway care as soon as you possibly can, okay? But ideally eye gel. Everyone happy with that? Easy peasy. Cool. So like I say, sometimes bringing a team to the patient is great. Sometimes rendezvousing with a team on the way to hospital is fine. Sometimes going to hospital if it's close enough is okay as well. But it's quite a dynamic decision to make, yeah? Depending on your patient's deterioration, you may need to change your plan halfway through. Well, we've put an eye gel in, seems to be maintaining the area okay, halfway to hospital. This isn't enough. I need to bring someone to the patient, which is why making that call early is important. Okay. So, like I just said, preferable to perform it at the scene. If it can't be performed, then we should really be using basic maneuvers and transporting them. NICE recommend a 60-minute cutoff if you read their guidance, but the major trauma triage tool say 45 minutes. If you can't get to a major trauma center within 45 minutes, then you need to be considering an ED or a trauma team. Cool. So chest trauma. Now, the studies show that Clinical assessment for pneumothorax isn't amazing in terms of a way to identify whether we have a pneumothorax. It's far worse than sonography, 
But again, they won't bias ultrasound probes uh, or train us how to use them. But saying that, it is actually fairly accurate in the pre-hospital setting, as long as we take our time and we do it properly, do the assessment properly, yeah? So we have a good tool for this. NICE guidelines say that we should only be decompressing chest if they have a suspected pneumothorax and they're hemodynamically unstable or they have yeah, respiratory compromise, so if they're peri-arrest. Has everyone seen this? No, okay, gutted. <laughs> so this was rolled out, when was it rolled out, Dan? Oh, I know, it hurts my heart. This should be present in every trauma pack in Scotland. I know it isn't, <laughs> but it should be. If you don't have access to this, it's on at SAS and it's obviously on this presentation as well. This is something that I carry at work, not at home. Uh, this is something that I carry at work and it's a great checklist to just assure yourself, okay, I'm happy to decompress this chest here. So it should be, the yellow card should be in every trauma pack ideally. If it's not, maybe say to your team leader, because they can get copies from our uh, <clears throat> trauma consultant paramedic, or you can just print them off from our SAS. So again, we're not going to work through it because we're going to use it during part two. But if you have a bit, of, a bit of doubt in yourself, okay, I think he's got a pneumothorax, he's got quite a quiet chest. Should we just work through the tool? Is there a mechanism for tension? Have we considered pain? Absent breath sounds less than 92% sats on 15 liters of oxygen, systolic BP of less than 90 or respiratory rate of less than 10. That's a pretty good list to work through. That patient's pretty unwell. They have all these signs. So these are the patients that you should be considering. I'm gonna decompress their chest, yeah? Like I say, we're gonna work through the skill and everything else during part two. Don't worry too much about what you actually do, but it's that decision-making process. And you're gonna be involved with that, yeah? When you leave here, you're gonna become student paramedics. You're already student paramedics, but when you leave and you go into practice, they're gonna be like, you're a student. Do you think we should decompress this chest? You're gonna be involved in that chat, yeah? So this is a great tool to just clear it up for you. Keep you out of that danger zone where you're like, oh, will I decompress, will I not? This just answers the question for you. Everyone seen the ARS needle? Good, if you haven't seen it, please get it out of the trauma pack and I say play with it, but take it apart, don't play with it, but take it apart and see how it works. Uh, the studies would say that this is far more effective for decompressing chests than a large bore cannula because it's much longer. Uh, the studies would suggest that most anterior chest decompressions just don't get deep enough to get into the thoracic cavity, into the pleural space, so these are much better. It's a huge needle, <laughs> absolutely huge. But actually, NICE recommend that in the first instance, if you don't have somebody who can stick their finger in someone's chest, then we should always use needle thoracostomy first, yeah? Rather than panicking and going, oh, I need someone who knows what they're doing. I need, I need someone to come and decompress their chest properly. They recommend that you just decompress the chest with the needle first time, okay? And if that fails, then obviously we have other options. Try and get other uh, medical professionals to help. The faculty of pre-hospital care specifically recommend that we always use the ARS needle compared to an orange cannula, yeah? Unless you're talking about pediatric patients, but again, we'll talk about that during part two. So always try and use the ARS needle and just, if you're in doubt and the guideline says to do it, just do it, yeah? Chest trauma, easy peasy. What about hemorrhage control? How do we control hemorrhage? What tools do we have? Pressure, so that's the first one, yeah? Everyone just, pff, we've got these bandages, mate. Didn't he bother about pressure? Just whack a bandage on it. But direct pressure is the best tool we have for controlling hemorrhage, 100%. What else? Hemostatic dressings. So we've got the hemostatic dressings, which are brilliant and are really well proven from sort of battlefield medicine and experiences in Afghanistan. They, the, the Celox gauze is wonderful at preventing hemorrhage. And the best thing about Celox gauze is you can, you can put it pretty much anywhere. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's uh, radio opaque, so you can pack it into wounds. You can use it to sort of wrap around wounds and it's actually pretty effective. So we've got hemostatic dressings, 100%. What else? Tourniquet, okay. We'll talk about tourniquet in a minute. Great hemorrhage arrest device in the right circumstances. Fine, so we've got direct pressure, dressings, tourniquets, lots of different tools to control hemorrhage. Tourniquets, should only be used as a last resort after other measures have been applied. Now, 
This is a dangerous thing to put in a presentation, but I've put it in here for a reason. If you are a by the numbers algorithmic kind of practitioner, then only used as a last resort suggests to me that we need to have done direct pressure dressings, everything else before we go to a tourniquet. Is that a reasonable approach, do you think? No, why not? Exactly. <laughs> Totally, by the time you get to the tourniquet, they will have already bled out, right? So it's that engaging the, the, the thinking cap a little bit, exsanguinating patients, patients that are, you need to use the really, the really vivacious words, pissing blood, yeah, hosing everywhere. These are the patients that they have an obvious arterial bleed, a tourniquet is a, is a fair choice. The Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care recommendations say that they should always be applied if there's a complete traumatic amputation. No shit, fair enough. Or if, well, they don't say about exsanguinating hemorrhage, but if there is obvious, uncontrollable arterial hemorrhage, then a tourniquet is a fair choice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, interesting, so interesting. Uh, did everyone hear that? So, we've got a patient who has had a complete traumatic amputation of whatever limb, it doesn't really matter, but they're not actively bleeding. So why are they not actively bleeding? Probably because of vasospasm, the fact they've formed a clot. What's the other reason they might not be bleeding? <laughs> okay, so adrenaline and vasospasm and everything else. What about if they're just so hypovolemic or their pump function is so impaired? I'm not saying they were, but... GCS 15, so that's good. That's a good indication that they're pumped. Good, okay. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of dynamic decision-making, yeah? <sighs> what does the room think? Would you apply a tourniquet to that patient? You would, yeah, okay. Why? Yeah, totally. So I'm not, I, listen. So th this, is the, this, is where, this is the nitty gritty, right? we're all gonna have different opinions on what to do with that patient. You're right, the clock could be disrupted in movement and they could start hosing out en route. Uh, conversely, we wanna preserve tissue oxygenation, so perhaps a pie and a tourniquet isn't the best option and wrapping it with a blast dressing is a good option as well. These are your decisions to make. It's not for me to stand here and be like, you should have applied a tourniquet, I can't believe you did that wrong. I don't think that's wrong at all. I think that your approach is totally fair. Exactly. So I think, that's, I think that's absolutely valid, yeah. Also though, if you decided to apply a tourniquet, I wouldn't turn around and be like, wrong option. Do you know what I mean? There are very few, there are a few wrong options in pre-hospital care. Obviously we can do the wrong thing for the patient. The majority of the time when we do something wrong, it's because we've misunderstood the disease process, yeah. Very rarely do people do things incorrectly for malicious purposes. It's just not understanding. So I totally agree with you. Two different options there. And I think the room's pretty divided on what we would do. I wish I could give you a clear answer. What would you do, Dan? I, I kind of agree that yeah, I would have one on there just in case. Route, but I'm not gonna, tied on. Uh, yeah, same. I think I'd, I'd do that. Yeah. But I agree. I would put it in place before because you never know what's going to happen on route. Maybe this part of my release. The yeah. Might be disrupted. The cauterization of blood might get displaced. Absolutely. Yeah. But that again, it's just me. Yeah. No, I think, uh, how sensible is that? Do you know what I mean? You've got it there if you need it so you can just tighten up. You've got all the other dressings on. What more can you ask for? So, excellent. Good. Yes? <sighs> so, there's a lot of cases where, uh, historically, there are a lot of cases where tourniquets have been applied and they probably haven't been necessary. And then patients have either lost limbs or lost tissue because of them being applied. Now, to be honest with you, historically, it's kind of been overdone. Uh, you have four to six hours for a, for a peripheral limb. You put a tourniquet on it, the tissue can survive for four to six hours. But let's say you've got a patient that's entrapped. Pa tourniquets have been applied and they've been left on for a long time. People don't always write the time that they were applied. They just weren't consistently applied before. 
uh, it needs to be exsanguinating hemorrhage, really, rather than just a minor bleed. People were putting them on for, oh my God, he's bleeding, put a tourniquet on, and it, people were losing limbs as a result. So exsanguinating hemorrhage, pissing, hosing out, or amputations are when we should be using them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, do you know there's a there's a there's a presentation later today called compartment syndrome and crush injury. So maybe we'll cover it then. <laughs> Sorry, I would love to answer your question there, but we're going to talk about it later. So that's good. Uh, excellent. Something to think about for later. <laughs> Absolutely, good stuff. Any other questions? Okay. Tourniquets are amazing when they're used properly. I can think of one patient in particular, again, not going to war story you. Uh, he'd been doing something to his window with an angle grinder. He was up a set of stairs and he went poof, straight through his arm. And we were there minutes after the injury. Tourniquet went on, student put on, did an amazing job, saved the guy's life. Yeah. When you need it, you need it. So these is one of the, this is one of the tools that I would maybe suggest to you. You don't keep in the trauma pack, like in a cupboard somewhere in the back of the ambulance and you're like, wrapped in plastic <laughs> i know <laughs> these are the kind of things you need in your response bag so you can throw them on the patient as quickly as possible because this is it's really time critical stuff yeah so tourniquet is a great tool when they're used in the right context uh, if you want to read the faculty of pre-hospital care statement which does explain a lot about why they're overused then 2017 it's on the faculty of pre-hospital care website i think i put it on blackboard as well grant <clears throat> okay so pelvic binders we want you to consider pelvic binders as a hemorrhage control device, all right? Because that's what they are, really. Uh, they <clears throat> are used for stabilizing fractures, but they're used for minimizing bleeding within the pelvic ring. Now, I'm not going to go on too much about this because Dan's got a whole presentation on it later. But just remember, in all these hemorrhage control mitigating measures that we have, pelvic binders fit in here too. What else fits in here? We've talked about dressings, tourniquets, direct pressure, pelvic binders. Blast dressings, yep, just put them in with dressings. Drugs, okay, what drugs? TXA, okay, amazing. So this covers TXA as well, hemostatic agents. We're going to talk a bit about how TXA works in a bit. Really, really effective at reducing mortality from pre-hospital trauma. Right now, we're only a few items in. We've talked about destination, area management, hemorrhage control, management of chest trauma. That's a lot of tools for one clinician. Okay, so that's my underlying point for this presentation is that you are equipped with the tools. Yes, other clinicians have lots of tools too, but we're the ones that have all these tools that make the decisions and use them early. All right, so TXA, brilliant. What other drugs? No one wants to say fluid, eh? It's, <laughs> it's like a taboo word when you're talking about trauma. Okay, so we have fluid as well. Uh, do I cover fluid? Yeah, okay. So we have IV fluid. Is IV fluid the resuscitation drug of choice in trauma? Definitely not. Uh, it's uh, not normal saline. Certainly causes a lot of issues in trauma. There are certain circumstances where we will ask you to use fluid in trauma, but they are very isolated examples. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. So NICE recommends that all major trauma patients get the biggest cannula you can possibly put in them, ideally two. If you work with a really switched on clinician or you have enough hands, this is where you go, oh, Dan, nice to see you. You've turned up to this trauma job. Can you put a second cannula in? Yeah, because these patients may need lots and lots of blood or fluid at some point. So the biggest cannula you can fit. What else do we have as an alternative to a cannula? IO, okay. So if this fails, consider IO access. In children, we're going to encourage you to use IO access as the first line route of administration. Mainly because, I know, Jesus. <laughs> Totally. I don't want to IO kids either, believe me. Uh, peripheral IV access can sometimes be a bit tough in kids. Now saying that, I mean, I've met quite a few paramedics that are more than comfortable cannulating kids, but in the trauma situation, it's hard enough to cannulate a trauma patient who's hemodynamically unstable, let alone a child. All right. So IO is a great tool. Please use it. Okay. And when it comes to part two, we're going to expect you to use it first, as well as in cardiac arrest for kids. You just go straight to IO, just bypass IV altogether. We've also got 
fluid if blood is not available? Now, blood. People see it as this like amazing panacea. Why don't we carry blood? It's amazing. It fixes all our patients. But actually, not only is it really technical to give, but also it, it's just not feasible for us to carry it. So this is another situation where you're going to have to think about your patient. How hemodynamically unstable are they? Can I take them to blood or can blood be brought to me? Yeah. All about this is always going to be a better option than giving them fluid, but sometimes they might need a volume, some kind of volume resuscitation before we can give them blood. What's the problem with fluid? Why don't we want to give it? Yeah, so it doesn't carry oxygen. <laughs> what else? No clotting factors, doesn't clot. What is fluid, IV fluid? It's sodium chloride, yeah, so. Uh, introducing an amount of sodium into the bloodstream isn't particularly going to be great in terms of electrolyte balance. This is all stuff that we're going to talk about later. But basically, normal saline is, is shit. <laughs> yeah, uh, for volume resuscitation and trauma. So this only happens pre-hospital. So consider how you can get these patients, figure them out early. This patient's hypovolemic. They need blood. How can I get blood to them? Or how can I take them to blood? Okay, all part of that dynamic decision-making process. If we're gonna give fluid, is everyone happy with the concept of permissive hypotension? Has everyone heard of that? A couple of shaking heads, okay. So we're gonna talk about fluid restriction later. Really, if we give IV fluid in large amounts, not only is it, it doesn't carry oxygen, it causes hemodynamic uh, derangements and electrolyte derangements, but if we give a large volume of it, there's the potential for it to bust clots. We're going to talk all about clotting later. So fluid is potentially not great. So if we're going to give it, we're going to give very small amounts. Okay. JR Calc says to a systolic of 60. Now, if you've got a clapped out trauma patient in front of you, are you going to get a reliable blood pressure? Probably not. So we're going to advise you to give fluid to a palpable central pulse. So that's carotid or femoral. Okay. Just running you through these things. We're going to talk about them a lot more later and in part two. Okay. So always to palpable central pulses if we're forced to give it. And then pain management. So nice say that morphine is great and morphine is great, but what's the problem with morphine and trauma? Yeah, so it's an opiate. It does have an effect on blood pressure. There are obviously other analgesics that we don't have access to. Any other analgesics that we do have access to that can work in trauma though? Paracetamol, okay. And you know, giving your patient, your trauma patient, an uh, oral tablet of paracetamol if they're conscious and they have, I don't know, like a long bone fracture or something like that. Brilliant. Give them some paracetamol. Give them a bit of morphine. Paracetamol takes, what did we say it was to reach peak plasma concentration? About 20 minutes. So you give your first dose of paracetamol, you give some morphine. By the time the morphine has taken full effect, so is the paracetamol and you have a well-analgesed patient. Paracetamol definitely has a role here. But if your patient's critically unwell, can't give them paracetamol, yeah? IV paracetamol has been trialed in places. Has anybody been involved in that? No, nobody here. Aberdeen, I think they're trialing it at the moment. So that definitely has a role as well. So nice recommend using IV morphine as your first line analgesic. Obviously, trauma teams have options for ketamine in sub-anesthetic doses. Again, can I bring it to the patient or can I take the patient to it? Morphine has been shown to be really, really effective, but you need to be careful about blood pressures. And in kids, because we don't take blood pressures in kids anymore, we're gonna use peripheral pulses to guide us. All right, but again, we'll talk lots more about morphine in part two. That's the nice guidance. Now, there's a reason why I've ran you through all these things. I think it's very easy because we talk, that we're a jack of all trades profession, yeah? We've got to deal with medical patients. We've got to deal with cardiac arrests. We've got to deal with trauma patients. And it's really easy to put the emphasis on the medical stuff here. But I want to, you to remember, you've got loads of tools to deal with trauma and it's just putting them in the right place. So all of these measures that I've talked about, they're all given to us as paramedics, I suppose, presented to us. Here's a skill, you take it. Because they have the biggest effect on mortality. Yeah, that's why we're giving them and it's all about using them at the right time. It's all about stopping bleeding, Stabilizing injuries and clots, the, pre the prevention and management of shock, yeah, specifically hypovolemic shock in trauma, which is slightly different to hypovolemic in other uh, contexts, and eventual transport to definitive care.
That's what we care about in Trauma. And we have all the tools, uh, tools to deal with it. So that's what we're doing. We're about taking the multiply injured patient, stopping their bleeding, stabilizing them, and taking them to the right place. Everyone happy with that? Amazing.